part of the Motley family. Uh, been uh, been connected with uh, First Bible for since Andrew and I got married, which is a little over 26 years ago. And uh, Andrea and I were missionaries sent out here f- from from First Bible to the Czech Republic. Um, Andrew and I met when we were youth youth workers for the U.S. Army in Germany uh, in 1990, and then. Uh, Soon after we got married, we moved into a former communist Europe, and we spent 15 years uh, ministering uh, among form, in former communist Czech Republic. Um, and in many ways, we would not, I, I, uh, I want to just say, like, uh, I, as I'm standing here at First Bible, I realize we would not have been in, in, in Central Europe without you. Um, for, for me to be here is kind of like being among just former co-workers. We were standing together for a number of years. Um, and uh, so this is the, f- uh, I'm, I'm going to be, I'm, as has been said already, I'm going to talk tonight about the beginning of a new work here in Rochester called Refuge Rochester. It's a, uh, it's a group of people coming together to see if we can mobilize a church to embrace refugees and immigrants here in our community. And this is the first church I'm talking to. Uh, I've talked with a couple of small groups and I've been, we, we held a conference in January that a number of churches came to, but this is, uh, we officially incorporated within the last month and have started a nonprofit organization to help uh, help the church embrace refugees. But to me, it's, it's fitting for me to be here as the kind of the first official introducing Refuge Rochester among uh, a group uh, of fellow followers of Jesus who have stood with me and, and, and invested in my family in so many ways. So I'm very glad to be here, and uh, you have been a, a great part of, of, of our lives and ministries for years. Um, but like, like uh, it's, it's fitting to say, uh, to kind of just talk about our time in Europe, because in many ways this, this work among refugees for me personally started when I came back from, from Europe in 2009. Um, I, I, I almost never say I came back. I usually say we came to America. It, it, it didn't necessarily feel like we were coming home anymore after living in Europe for 20 years. Uh, when I came here in 2009, um, I, I, it, I, I didn't have an easy transition. In fact, for a number of years, I, I really was wondering, what am I doing here? I was the pastor of a church in the Czech Republic. Uh, which is one of the most unreached countries in the world. And I often, it just, it was, it was the right time for us to be here. But in many ways, I was just wondering, what should I do here? Um, we, there was a new church plant starting in the city, so we, we joined that. But in many ways, I, I, I still was just looking. I, so I did some preaching, and we, put, we, we, we were a part of different things. Andrea was a teacher at, at, at North Star um, but uh, um, in, in many ways, I, for, for the years that I've been here since, since living in Europe, there's been this question of me, what should I do with this international experience I have? Um, I got a job with uh, just a small medical equipment company here in Rochester, uh, just began to work uh, in the medical field uh, as a complete layperson, not, not in any way medically trained, but just delivering and taking, uh, maintaining, maintaining some, some special equipment. And in the course of my work with this company, I began to run into refugees here in Rochester. Um, and over the course of the years, I learned something about Rochester. And the one is that since the year 2000, a little over 10,000 refugees have resettled in, in the city of Rochester. Um, I, 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 we, I was talking with the A-Bears beforehand. I'm sure some of you, you're, you're aware of this. You, uh, they were talking about, like, you, you see them in the banks. Uh, where, in, where I go to different medical facilities, I began to see uh, just people, like I could tell they were, they were somewhat, they, they clearly weren't from this country. Uh, one, uh, uh, a key night happened a few years ago when I was delivering, a ma- uh, delivering one of our products to a family in the evening. And I went to an apartment, it was at Grease Commons, right, just right north of 104, over off Bone Steel. And uh, clearly the family was not from the United States. All the women were in hijabs. Only one, of the, one, of the, one or two of the kids spoke English. And I, they introduced themselves to me as a family that had just fled the war in Syria. Uh, and uh, so I, I sat down, we, I, I 
delivered the, I, put in, I was delivering a special mattress. I put the mattress on their bed. Their, their grandmother was on hospice, and she died about a few months later. But I was there to help set up this equipment for their grandmother on, hospital, uh, on hospice. We, um, we sat down and had tea together. Uh, I came back on Saturday for lunch, and uh, over the course of the years, I've just become friends with this very dear family from Syria. And, but that was just one example of a number of people that God was just bringing into, just, just into, the, into my network of friends who were refugees and immigrants that God had brought here to the city of Rochester. Uh, and as I talked with my friend, as I, talked, as I be, talked and got to know some of the people that God was bringing here, I began to hear just different, I, I began to just hear about different places that they would go to, to get care, like to learn how to uh, speak English or help, 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 help finding jobs or whatever. So I began to just see what is, what's happening for refugees and immigrants here in our city. And I, I began to go to places like the Catholic Family Center, where all refugees that are resettled here in Rochester are resettled by the Catholic Family Center. And I began to, uh, I, be, I went to different um, agencies where there were services provided for people who were, like I just said, learning English or trying to get themselves established here in our country. And I began to get a sense, and uh, after a while, I, I, I was wondering, I, I, I wasn't running into a lot of evangelical Christians. Like I said, all the refugees are settled by the Catholic Family Center, so I realized that their, their first exposure to Americans was through a Catholic organization. And um, I, I, I went to, I, I spent an evening, just went to, a, I, I heard about an agency that was um, helping people prepare to take the GED test. It was a tutoring class at night. It was, a, it was an agency down on, on Dewey Avenue. Uh, so I went there and I introduced myself. I just said, I've, I'm meeting some, I've met some refugees and I'm just trying to see what's happening among refugees here in Rochester. And so I spent an evening, the, the gentleman was a very kind man, but he basically was just like a kind of a Peace Corps kind of guy. He, he wasn't a, there wasn't any kind of religious background to him. He was just kind of a guy who was concerned about refugees and immigrants. Uh, and he started this agency. So uh, I said, well, can I, can I go see where, where's your tutoring actually happening? So I went back in the room where all the tutoring was happening, and um, there was a room about seven or eight women who were all from West African countries. There were from, a woman from the to Togo, Sierra Leone, some other, so just these, these beautiful, just African women that got brought here. When I realized that all of the tutoring was being done by Mormon missionaries. And I left that night, and I just said, I, I sat in my car, and I said, and this was one of a, a series of events where I began to have this, this, this subtle feeling. I, said, I just began to pray, God, would you do something to mobilize people? I said, uh, that, that, like I said, that agency is roughly, it's just right on Dewey Avenue. I, I sat there, and as I was driving home, I began to pray for churches that I knew. I just said, God, I don't know if you would bring somebody from Northridge Church or First Bible or or uh, Journey Church, or Greece Assembly, all those churches I knew were probably within a, a very short drive of that agency. Um, I knew there was a, 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 a small group from a couple, I knew a couple of small groups that were right, right down the street from this agency. And it's began to say, God, would you do something that someday, if I go to that, that agency, I won't see Mormon missionaries, which, hey, th I, I'm glad there's somebody caring for them, but I would, just, would you do something to mobilize people who know Jesus, who, who confess him as Lord, and, and are, are, are responding to what God has done by caring for these people that God's bringing in our community? So, so I began to pray for our first Bible about a year and a half ago. <laughs> I was praying for this night. Uh, I was thinking about, would God bring somebody, maybe from here or from any, I, I, I just was saying, God, I don't, I don't know, whatever church, if you could even unite some churches to say, there are got people that, 10,000 people that God has resettled from all around the world, we got to respond in some way. So, and, and as I was driving, as I was thinking, there was a few passages that I began to think of even that night that I reminded of, and I began to even to look at and personally look and see what is, what is a scriptural response and a viewpoint of this issue of refugees and immigrants and, 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 and that whole dynamic. Um, 
And I wanted to, I wanted to, so I wanted to say, first of all, that there is a work that's beginning. I, I'm going to, as by the end, I, I was just saying here in the beginning that when I first started kind of walking around the community, I, I, was, I had the sense that, that there weren't a lot of Christians. I want to show you some photos that as the, as the time has gone by, I, I, there are a lot of Christians here in Russia so that God is moving to come alongside refugees and immigrants. So I, I, they're, they're, God is really doing something. I want to talk to you about it so that if God is moving you, that there could potentially God could move you and some people here to engage and embrace the people that God's bringing. Uh, so I want you to get a picture of what God's doing, but I also want us to see a little bit of just maybe a, a little biblical perspective on this whole issue of refugees. So I want to look at, there's a very a passage that we know very well. I, I, I'm not sure I put the whole thing up there on the slides, but... Um, we're going to look at Matthew 25. So we've got a couple of verses. I'm going to read a few verses beforehand, then we're going to look at these some key verses where we get, begin to see a, a biblical perspective on, on refugees. Uh, I'm going to start reading in verse 31 of Matthew 25. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then the king, then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed my, of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was in hunger, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when did we, when saw we thee uh, and hungered and fed thee, or thirsty and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger and took thee in, or naked and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick or in prison and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as ye have done it unto the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. It's a famous passage of scripture, okay? Uh, I, we've read it many times. I want to make just three observations here. I want to just talk to you about three big, big thoughts here. The first thing we see here, uh, that I want to just point out is that Jesus gives us a list of people that require a response from us. Um, they're, 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 they're hungry. They're, they're sick. And he, and he equates how you respond to them is basically, when you, how you respond to them is how you responded to me. When you clothed that person who was, who, who was naked, when you fed that sick person, when you visited that person in prison, and when you saw a stranger and you welcomed him in, you were doing that unto me. And, I, um, and so, so the first big observation is that when we see that 10,000 refugees have resettled in our city, this is an opportunity for the church to welcome Jesus. How we respond to them is a, is, is a way that we respond to Jesus. He says very clearly here, I was a stranger and you took me in. Okay, so the first big observation is that how we respond to this list of people that Jesus describes here, those that are in prison, those that are sick, those that are strangers, that is a way is an opportunity for us to do this unto Jesus. The, the, as you did it unto the least of these, my brethren, you did it unto me. Okay? I want you to make a second observation here. Just think about this list of people here those that are sick, those that are in prison, those that are strangers. For me, each of these people is a disruption. Okay? If, you're, if your week rhythm, if your daily rhythm is like mine, I get up in the morning, Andrew and I both get up, uh, all our kids are out of the house, praise Jesus. We, we leave, uh, we, we're, we're kind of out of the day, out of the house, usually by like 6.30 in the morning, Andrew has to be at work at 7, I usually have something around that time. So we get up, we're out there, way. we go through our work days, we come home in the evening, have dinner, uh, there, there could be a small group, a midweek, you know, some kind of church activity during the week. But my, 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 day, my weekly rhythm consists of going to work, being around my church, going to, being with my family, and a few other things. In, or, in the course of my regular week, I don't run into someone in prison. 
It just doesn't happen to me. I happen to run into people who are sick, but it's not my job to take care of them, okay, just for my job, okay? Uh, when I meet, to, to, when Jesus says when, how you took care of the prisoner, how you took care of the sick, that's a disruption for me. It, it requires that I step out of my, of my week, weekly rhythm. Like when I met that family from Syria, I had to stay and have tea. I had to come back on Saturday. It's, it's, uh, every time I go and, and uh, see them, it's, I try to see them like once or twice a month, it, it's, it, it requires that I step out of my daily rhythms. And this is one, I, I, I would just like you to, I would just leave that thought with you and to ask the question, what is the significance that Jesus lists himself, how you interact with these people that were a disruption to you? That's how you, how you interact with me. He comes to us in the form of a disruption. And it takes me out of my rhythm. And I can only uh, assume a few things about that, why that's important to him. Somehow taking me out of what I plan, what I want to accomplish, and responding to him, it means something to him. And he says, how you, how you welcome the stranger, how you respond to, this, to this, 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 this disruption is how you responded to me. I left that night when I saw, uh, I went through that season when I was sensing there's, there's a lot of people in our community responding to refugees, but I'm not sure how many Christians are. I began to sense that God was moving something in me, okay? It, it, and that leads to, to the third, to the third uh, kind of observation. The, this, the, the stranger, this, I wanted to focus in on the stranger. Jesus says, I was a stranger and you took me in. This, as we look back over the Old Testament, as I began over the last this season of my life when I sensed God moving me in this way, uh, throughout the Old Testament, God often returns and he exhorts his people to care for the stranger. Okay, I want to look at one passage. This is one of many. It's in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 10, verse 17 and 18. This is a, an exhortation that, that God gives through Moses here. He returns to this. I was just reading in the book of Psalms today, uh, and it, I saw it again. Jesus, God reminding his people of this very thing right here. This is what he says in Deuteronomy 10. For the Lord your God is a God of gods. And Lord of lords, a great God, a mighty and a terrible, which regardeth not persons, nor taketh reward. He doth execute the judgment of the fatherless and widow, and loveth the stranger, in giving him food and raiment. Love ye therefore the stranger, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. This phrase right here, you were strangers in the land of Egypt, and God looping the strangers in with, with widows and orphans, he does it all throughout Scripture. He does it all throughout the Old Testament. He's always exhorting his people, love the stranger, because you were strangers at one time. It seems like God has a soft spot in his heart for the stranger. We could, we could look at uh, the, the book of um, Ruth, you know, when we see uh, God bring Naomi uh, to uh, the, the land of Moab, and she comes back to Israel with her daughter-in-law, who is a stranger and a foreigner. And, and, and God takes the stranger and puts him in the lineage of Jesus. He's somewhere in the heart of God, this is close to him. How we treat strangers, it means something to him. And he says, I was a stranger, you came, I came to you, and you took me in. Somehow, this is, this is one of the important things on the heart of God. So when I was, when I was driving home that night and I saw uh, just in, in this season when God was kind of um, kind of doing something to me, uh, another scripture came to mind. I want to look at that too. It's in the book of Acts. Uh, in uh, Acts chapter 17, Paul, he's, uh, he's in the city of Athens and he is addressing people in the um, on Mars Hill. And this is one of the things he says here. This, this, this particular verse came to me as I was praying for these, these people from Africa that I just saw and just asking God to move some of his people here. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. And hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, 
and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. This is the verse that came, this is the particular verse that came to my mind. That God hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. And this is why he determines where and when people live. That they should seek the Lord. If happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of one of your poets have said, for we are all also his offspring. So I, 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 I left that night, and this thought came to my mind that God is a God who determines the times and the places of people. And I, I left home and I thought, there's some people there that were born in, let's say, Togo, the country of Africa. They fled their country for so, whatever reason it was. They ended up in some UN refugee camp in some other country. <laughs> and and they, they, they received some ticket to go to a city called Rochester that they, they probably never heard of before they heard, you're going to move to the city of Rochester. And they end up here, and I, I left God, and I said, God, I'm, 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 I'm angered. I'm a little riled up that you determine the times and the places. And again, careful by Mormons. And I, I left, I said, God, I'll, I'll, I'll do what you want me to do. You know, um, I began to volunteer. I, I, I started, I said, if, if the church is going to volunteer, I'm going to be the church. So I, uh, just, just recently I've been, uh, I started, I went, I, uh, like I said, all refugees are uh, resettled here by the Catholic Family Center. And they, um, they have to go through a uh, basic, uh, just a whole series of steps once they get here before they can officially uh, get all their papers and everything kind of sorted. One of the things they have to do is they have to go through a cultural orientation class for two hours. And they may, uh, it, it's kind of boring. Uh, but the Catholic Family Center looks for a volunteer, so I said, I'll come and teach your culture orientation class. I lived outside the country. I can help them uh, orient to the culture, you know. Uh, so uh, a couple times a month, I do some of my vacation time, and I, I, uh, I've been, t tomorrow morning, I'm going to be teaching a class there for 12 people who just arrived here within the last 90 days from Afghanistan. What do you think about that? You know, uh, uh, last week I was with a group of people from Nepal, and one of the things I say to them is I say, you know what, I'm a pastor, and I am here. So I want to say welcome. And the church is welcoming you. I'm the church, and I'll welcome you. And because uh, that's what Jesus said to do. He said, I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. And um, I think about you. I think about First Bible. I think about Northridge. I think about the churches that I'm praying and I'm saying, um, you told us to welcome you. You're bringing people here. I'm going to come and welcome you. And, we're at, and um, we are uh, forming an organization, and we're saying, how can we mobilize the church to welcome those that God brings? Um, like I said, I've, I've, been, uh, uh, um, I've been moved by, by this whole issue here. There's a few things I've learned. Um, among people of non-Christian religious traditions in North America, most of them, so this, what we mean by that is people who are, you know, Buddhist, Muslim, Hindus, most of them are refugees and other immigrants. 60% of those of a non-Christian religious background said they do not personally know a Christian. My, I, I told you about my friends from Syria. Um, they've been here for a couple of years. They've said to me many times, they, they, they go to school, they have some, some acquaintances, but they said, Ken, we, you, you're our only American friend. Um, this is a common, common experience. I was just at a prayer meeting a few weeks ago where I brought two of the deacons from a Burmese church here in town that I've become very good friends with. These two Burmese uh, Man, they speak really poor English. They both were born in a jungle. <laughs> but they, uh, I, I, I knew about a prayer meeting that was happening at a home. Just two blocks from the house, I said, walk on down there, meet me there. And I told the people that hosted this prayer meeting, I said, these men have lived in the, in the United States for three years. This is the very first American home they've ever been in. And, and these guys are evangelists. They both work at Walmart, and they've told, they've, they've, in as little English they could, anybody who works in their Walmart shift, they make sure they know about Jesus. Okay. 
uh, they came here as Christians, okay? Many refugees that come here are Christians, and, but what, what, what very, very few of them actually befriend or become friends with an American. I took some guys, very first home ever been in. Here's another thing. Just 35% of white evangelicals in the U.S. say they personally know a Muslim, and even fewer know a Hindu or a Buddhist. Um, there's, I mentioned that we had a conference in January. We're, I'm getting ready to, there's a potential we're going to have a sec, another conference this coming January. We're inviting a woman who came here to the United States from Pakistan with her family as a 10-year-old. And one of the things she talks about is that for the first 25 years she lived here, she didn't hear the gospel. She lived in the United States of America for 25 years before she heard the gospel. And the reason why is she lived in her Muslim community. You know, it, it, it's no fault of anybody, but very often people will move here from other parts of the country. There's difficulties. They're nervous. They're, they, they don't feel like they can really talk to anybody. They're, they can't get over their language barriers. They feel, they feel a distance, and they don't step over that distance. And very, very few of them actually meet and befriend a, native, a, a person who is actually American. Um, Here's a, here's a, here's a, something I miss the There's something missionally malignant. Whenever we are willing to make great sacrifices to travel the world to reach a people group, but are not willing to walk across the street. Um, so there's a group of us who are saying, there's, there's a, there's a, there's a group of people coming together and we're saying, uh, we're going to try to create a platform where the church can stand together to reach refugees. I mentioned that moment of when I, I saw the Mormon missionaries. There was another moment that I, that I, I feel like I just want to talk to you about. I, I, um, there was a, I, last September I went to have dinner with my friends from Syria, and I, uh, it, was a, it was a Muslim holiday, and I just... I, I, so they invited me over for dinner, and uh, uh, it was the festival of Eid. I'd never even heard of it. So I, sa I sat down and I said, um, tell me about what, what do you do on this holiday? What, what do Muslims do on this holiday? And it's basically a combination of Halloween and Thanksgiving. They have a big meal, and kids walk to their neighbor's relative's house and get chocolate. But I said, what did you do today? What, tell me about what you did today here, and you know, you're not in your home country. And I said, well, we went to morning prayers. So um, I said, where'd you go to morning prayers? I said, did you go to your, the mosque that you normally go to? And they said, well, no, the mosque was too small. So they, I said, well, so they, they got out their phones and they showed me some video clips and some photos of a Muslim prayer service that, that had been organized at the, um, the, the Dome, uh, East Henrietta. It's a conference center over in Henrietta. And I looked at the photos and I, I was stunned. Um, there was probably 1,500 people gathered to pray. So I left that home, and it was one of those, one, another one of those moments where I left and I said, God, there were 1,500 Muslims gathered to pray in my city. And, and I, I sensed the, the Spirit again saying, what are you going to do? <laughs> and I also had a sense, this is too big for one church. It's just, this, is, this is not just what one church, one, one church says, we're going we're gonna to address the Islam. It, it was, again, uh, this sense that churches need to stand together. And over the course of, of this time, uh, I, have, I have run into Christians and churches that are embracing refugees. I, I want to show you a few photos. Of the, these are some things that are happening right here in Rochester. This is a, a group of people that uh, I've started working closely with. They're, they're, it's a group of people that have moved into a kind of an underserved neighborhood uh, called the Beechwood neighborhood. This is a, a church called New City Fellowship. This is a Syrian family that they met. Uh, they, they meet on uh, Garson Street, uh, uh, RC, Parcel Street, right down in the city. And uh, what they've discovered, all around there, there's, there's folk, a lot of refugees are being right, resettled right there. So there's this group of evangelical Christians that have decided to try to reach this un underserved neighborhood, and they've run into refugees from the Congo, from Syria, from Iraq, from Afghanistan, um, uh, Somalia, right there in the neighborhood. Just all, all, there's probably 20 to 30 homes that have refugees living right there. Uh, and this is their, just having a little party. Um, this is some folks who are just visiting them. 
So this is, this is some Christians reaching out uh, to refugees right in their neighborhood. This is some people from uh, another church, from Browncroft, uh, as I, as from Browncroft Community Church over, over on the, the east side. Uh, they as a church are actively uh, really going after refugees. So here's, some, here's a small group that took a, uh, this is an Afghani family, they took to pick apples for the first time in their life. Uh, this is a uh, Burmese family that was, you can see they're uh, welcoming, uh, uh, congr- uh, welcoming a new baby. So some Christians got together, brought them a cake and said, uh, uh, congratulations on a new baby. Here's another small group, took some, um, I believe these are Iraqi, uh, an Iraqi family, and uh, introduced them to uh, fall activities here. Here's the small group, took some kids trick-or-treating. You can see some Iraqi kids there. This is another group. Uh, this is a Syrian family went trick-or-treating with uh, this small group from church. So it's just some Christians coming alongside them. Uh, this is Andrea at a Thanksgiving meal we did for refugees in, uh, for, uh, last Thanksgiving. This is a, Sy- a couple of Syrian uh, girls. So, so, so one of the things that, I, that has become clear to me is that there are Christians around the city of Rochester who are, who are really engaging with, with, uh, with refugees. And uh, like I said, they have asked if, if I would step into the leadership of, of a nonprofit that we're forming together. And the purpose of this is to do these types of things. Educate us, educate churches here in Rochester about a biblical view of refugees, but also provide a way for churches to potentially even engage with, with uh, refugees. Um, I want to talk to you about here just a couple ways you can respond. Um, to, to this, this whole thing. This is just a, 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 just a quick overview. We're getting near the end of our time. Uh, I just wanted to give you just a little bit of an introduction, a, a couple of ideas. But uh, we are, we are uh, a group of us are on a journey together. We're, we're going to be uh, starting a Facebook page next week that'll be a, a way for Christians to kind of connect, get some, get some information, get some opportunities to hear some uh, volunteer opportunities. So you can, uh, you can connect through this uh, new nonprofit through our Facebook page. Uh, by the end of the month of June, we're going to have our, our website up, up and going. We're, after that, we'll, we're going to introduce a, a monthly newsletter uh, that will be just kind of highlighting what God's doing, giving uh, some more educational pieces, and also just uh, uh, letting us know about some uh, volunteer opportunities. You can also be praying. There's, uh, there are 10,000 people that God's brought here, and those are just refugees. Uh, there, are, there are different legal immigrants that, that God has brought here from Cuba, Puerto Rico. The number of people that God has brought here to the city of Rochester who are not born here that would fall into that, I was a stranger and you took me in, the opportunity is huge. So you can be praying that God would move his people to welcome a stranger. Uh, If you want to connect with me and kind of keep following us at Refuge Rochester, uh, we can let you know about some some individual opportunities to volunteer and serve among refugees, some of these agencies. Like the agency I was telling you about that's doing the tutoring, uh, they just contacted contacted me this week. They have uh, driving classes on Saturday morning. They're looking for people who would love to come and help people uh, prepare to take their driver's test. So if you ever taught your teenage daughter or son how to drive and you want to come and help a refugee uh, learn how to drive, maybe sign language or turn this way or, you know, uh, cross in a language barrier, but there, there, there's an opportunity there. Uh, like uh, uh, there's, uh, there's opportunities to teach English as a second language. Um, there was an agency that, uh, that I was meeting recently that is helping legal immigrants and refugees who are ready to take their citizenship, citizenship test, prepare for it. Just uh, it was somebody come, want to come in and spend two hours just uh, helping them uh, prepare to answer the questions that comes on a citizen, citizenship test. If you ever took a citizenship test, you would be sobered to know that they have, there's a hundred questions that they have to learn and when they'll, they'll sit in front of a community of people who will ask them any six of those hundred questions. They have to be ready to answer any of those six questions. So they're looking for people who would come and say, I'll sit with you for an hour, ask you different questions. They got cue cards for you. But if you want to learn, if you would like to be uh, volunteering in any way, there's all kinds of different agencies that are are looking for volunteers, and we're asking that God would move the church to, to be some of those people. So like I said earlier, so I come in there and see a tutoring class, and, and I see some evangelical Christians, people who know Jesus, uh, sitting in some of those same places. I'd love to see that. 
one other way, uh, uh, some of those, a lot of those photos you saw were like specific small groups or groups of people coming and saying, help us to actually come alongside one family and, and just befriend them over the, long, over the long haul. Do things like introduce them to, uh, to American holidays, take them trick-or-treating, um, uh, share life with them a little bit more. And so the, specifically that church down in the city, and there's another Nepalese church up in the kind of northern, like closer by here that uh, I, we're working with very closely as evangelical churches right in those neighborhoods saying, can, they, they would love to, if you would say, we would love like our small group or a group of people kind of befriend a, a one specific family over the long haul, kind of like, what, uh, like the, what, what we as a family have done with our friends from Syria. Uh, those are ways that you can welcome the stranger among us, okay? Uh, one of the last thing is you can financially support the work of Refuge Rochester. Uh, there's a... Uh, I'm, like I said earlier, I'm uh, using my vacation time to step into these volunteer roles. My vacation time is going to run out in, in June. At that point, I'm going to go part-time in that company, and I will step into the part-time executive directorship role of Refuge Rochester. So the board has, has asked if I would start raising funds to help uh, provide at least a part-time salary for me as I do that. Um, there's a day coming for each of us, where Jesus is going to divide sheep on one side, goats on the other. And I'm praying that there will be, as, as I stand there, as we stand there as a church of Rochester, that I know we're going to hear him say, I was a stranger and you welcomed me. Um, this isn't for everybody. Like, there's a whole list of people. We saw there's people here, I know there's people here at First Bible that uh, visit people in prison. I don't do that. Because uh, I know somebody else is doing that. I, I'm, I'm going to welcome the stranger. There's people who are coming alongside those who are sick. Uh, but I know that Jesus is going to look at the church of Rochester. He's going to look at this collective body and say, I was in prison and you visited me. Because there's people doing that. And I was a stranger and you took me in. And whatever disruption <laughs> is caused in our lives by these people, this list of people that, that Jesus identified himself with at that moment, it's going to be worth it because we're going to hear him say, I was naked and you clothed me. I was hungry and you fed me. I was a stranger and you took me in. And I'm looking forward to that day as we stand together there. Uh, let me pray for us and then we'll... I'm going to be standing in the back. There's a table back there. If you want to sign up and just give me your information, we'll put you on the mailing list. We'll let you know when opportunities that we can keep communicating. Um, we can keep talking. Let me just pray.